It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. On my video about Donald Trump and atheists, I received very interesting comments to say the least. Now, this comment right here says, I'm open about this, and you know something else has to be out there. There's a better chance of that than your existence here and now. I am guess I'm saying that we have to have some help from something. After all, who rubs two sticks together long enough to create a fire, and even with hard work and perseverance doesn't come even easy today. These other comments say right here, Sorry that you don't believe in God. It's not about anyone's religion. It's about what's right for the most people. You're a fool. That should not be taken as demonizing. You aren't really aware, but you're offering a comment section, so there's mine. Save yourself. When I was reading the comment section, I realized that I never made a video in all my years on my YouTube channel on why exactly I'm an atheist, so here's the video for you guys. Now keep in mind, I don't want to push the idea that I am right and everybody else is wrong, because it's actually really arrogant to say that out loud, and these are my own personal opinion based upon the observations I've seen, the data I've learned throughout the years, and so I'm not saying that my view is the absolute right view and that everybody else is wrong, but here are my personal thoughts on why exactly I consider myself to be an atheist. Now, according to Merriam-Webster, an atheist is a person who does not believe in the existence of a god or any gods. Now, underneath that definition, I fit it quite well, largely because I don't actively, of course, believe any sort of supernatural beings, deities, gods, or goddesses as I record this video. One of the main reasons why I don't necessarily buy into the ideas of supernatural beings are interpersonal is largely because it seems as though that the deity in question, depending on where you live, is a self-reflection of the person that believes that deity and also the culture surrounding it. For example, if a person comes directly from India, that god is going to directly reflect Indian culture. If a person lives in European countries, in America and Canada, and the rest of Latin America, that god is going to reflect the culture within those societies as well. And so their ideas, their theology about that particular deity or supernatural being is a self-reflection of themselves and they're also their cultural surroundings around them. If a god comes directly from Africa, for example, it's going to reflect African cultures and African ideals depending upon where that person lives in the African continent. Now, the idea that there are various gods that self-reflect humans is not necessarily a far-fetched idea. Now, according to this article that's been done by Psychology Today, it says right here that anthropomorphism is the attribution of human characteristic or behavior to non-human entities, including animals. Some people are more inclined to anthropomorphize things than others, but it's a common way of perceiving and interacting with the world. Now, anthropomorphism is the idea, and where someone sees human-like attributes into a non-human, it's often associated with the bonds between humans and their beloved pets, or possessions, or the way they interpret human be animal behavior. People can also anthropomorphize in imagining that unseen beings such as gods possess human features. Perceiving the presence of human characteristics and other entities can be misleading when such qualities are absent, but anthropomorphism may not always be totally off base. While a pet rock is never happy to see its owner, some animals might actually experience something like emotional states that people perceive in them. A tribulation to human intent and non-human animals, spirits, robots, or other entities, real or imagined, is one way that people make sense of the behaviors and the events that they have encountered. Humans are a social species of a brain that evolved to quickly process social information. The tendency to view non-humans in terms of human-like characteristics has been theorized to be a product of that evolution. Now, again, according to Psychology Today, where it says, why do humans keep inventing gods to worship? 
is as I record this video, there's at least 18,000 different gods, goddesses, and various animals that have been worshipped by humans, that spirituality or religiosity has been mapped to the brain circuit that was centered on a brain region called the polycrural gray. This brain circuit and the appearance of portents of the secular gray may have involved to encourage altruistic behaviors and to also reduce fear. There's also a book that's called Why Do We Believe in Gods by J. Anderson Thomas that goes into great details of the psychology on why humans make God into our own image. And the clip I'm going to play right now is actually a segment of a lecture that he actually did on this particular topic. Hyperactive agency detection. All of us will mistake a shadow for a burglar. We will never mistake a burglar for a shadow. We have these hyperactive agency detection mechanisms. If we were to hear a loud bang right now, we would all startle and we would assume it was not an accident, it was agency and probably human agency. Now, you may reasonably ask, well, okay, how does decoupled cognition interacting with another, how does hyperactive agency, how does that lead to supernatural figures though? I mean, to you know, supernatural burglars. Okay, how do you get the, the next level up from human to supernatural? This. Your minds fill in, there's no, there are no lines there, but your minds see that square and fill in the lines. It's called intuitive reasoning. And it underlines the essence of religious ideas, which are minimally counterintuitive worlds. MCIs. Now, what is, what is this? It's an optimal compromise between the interesting and the expected. And it gives us attention arresting and memorable things. Let me illustrate. If I tell you that that big tree out in front of the conference center will do your taxes, wash your laundry, um, uh, you know, reprogram your computer, uh, you're simply not going to believe me. But if I tell you that tree, on the night of a full moon, will hear your wishes and grant them, you might be vulnerable to believing that. Not this audience, but many people. <laughs> but you might, you might be vulnerable to it, because there's just one slight twist, but everything you know about trees is intuitively in there, and you fill in the blanks. Now, think of, think of the, the, the Judeo-Christian God, okay? He's everywhere. There's a little twist of physics, but it's just a guy. And you fill in the blanks. You don't even think about it, but you fill in the blanks. There, there's no violation of basic human assumptions. He's a guy. He can understand my southern accented English. Um, <laughs> You know, all the, all the assumptions about humanness are filled in. There's just one little twist. And all religious ideas have these supernatural templates. They have a counterintuitive physical property, like, you know, God is everywhere. A counterintuitive, uh, may have a counterintuitive piece of biology, the virgin birth. But Mary is otherwise just a girl. Uh, counterintuitive psychology, you know, God knows what I'm thinking. But if he knows what I'm thinking, why do I still have to pray to him? Why do I still have to talk to him? Because again, those basic assumptions about humanness are all still intact. That's why we believe it. That's why we'll, we'll start to accept it. And that's why it sticks in our heads. There's always, always the attribution of mental states, human mental states. Look at any religious idea. You know, go back to your college uh, courses, think about any religious system, any religious ideas you know of, and they fit this model. Now, we see this most clearly, some of these vulnerabilities in children. And, I mean, we're all children grown up. Children from very early on are common sense dualists. What does this mean? It means you can take a five-month-old and you can have a box, you can ar arrange for a box to move, jump, start like a person, and a five-month-old will startle, you know? 
A five-month-old doesn't startle when a human being moves in exactly the same way. So very early on, you start to see that we have systems that are designed for dealing with agents with intentions and goals and physical objects. Now, children know more than they learn. We come into the world with these systems already in place. It is natural from very early on to think of disembodied minds. Now, you can flip it around and you can understand why this is crucial. If I required a body to think about that person's mind, that's a real liability. It, it, it's, it's burdensome. I need to be able to think about somebody and think about what's going on in them and what their intentions or goals might be without them present. Jesse Baring in, in Ireland did some fascinating experiments, a puppet show in which an alligator eats a mouse. And then the children are asked, well, does the mouse still need to eat or drink? And the children say no. Is the, the mouse still moving around? No. Does the mouse think certain things? Does the mouse want certain things? The children say yes. You start to see that division. Half of four-year-olds, if you interview them, have imaginary friends. So that we see that the belief in some life separate from what is actually experienced in the body is the default setting of the human mind. Another thing about children is that they are causal determinants. What does this mean? Well, any mind that is oriented towards seeing intentions and desires and goals is going to overread purpose. If you ask a child, what are birds for? You know, to, to sing. What are rivers for? For boats to float on. What are rocks for? And for animals to scratch themselves. Okay? We, we overread causality, way overread causality and purpose. Another aspect that I notice amongst believers is the idea that the God that they pray to often tends to manifest themselves in various ways on the earth. For example, there are many believers that claim that they can hear God talking to them through their head. Now, what exactly is the condition where people can hear voices in their heads? This type of condition is known as auditory hallucinations. Now, auditory hallucinations happens when you hear voices or noises that don't exist in realities. In some cases, they are temporarily and harmless, while in other cases, they may be a sign of a more serious mental health or neurological condition. Auditory hallucinations may have many possible causes. Let's take for the case of music. There are many cases where there are people that have been ported to just listen to music in their head, even though music itself is not necessarily playing in the background, but they can still hear music anyway, even though it's not playing anywhere. That would be one particular case of an auditory hallucination, or if somebody were to have like voices in their heads, that's also seem to be caused by naturalistic processes within our brain. There's no sort of direct evidence either way that there's something out there that's actually causing the auditory hallucination, but rather what's happening within our brains themselves. There's also a study that's been done by the Independent where it says why live music gives you goosebumps revealed in a new study. Now, the main reason why I particularly took this study of all the studies is largely because the vast majority of Christian believers claim that they necessarily experience the Holy Spirit depending on the church that they go to. Now, according to this particular study, it seems as though that experts have discovered why live music gives you goosebumps and it's partially to do with the meaning of the song and also the volume of the song. Now, according to the study, they moderate the heart rates and the skin conductive of subjects who listen to three of their favorite pieces of music. Now, according to the study, the intensity of the lyrics, the raising pitch, the hormonal intervals, and collective crowd singing emerge as the key factors on why people are actually giving them goosebumps. Now the CF recognized the cognitive factors and that the SC is a social and environmental context such as the collective experience. 
The ID stands for individual differences, such as the engagement of the music, and AP is the music properties or the rapid increase or decrease in volume. Now, the pulse bumps is the percentage chance of getting goosebumps. Many of my studies have been attempted to investigate what causes the emotions we feel while listening to music, but these typically have taken place in a lot of settings. We have never have been able before to explore how multiple factors influence the likeliness of experienced goosebumps and a real world conflict. If we can know that humans can have goosebumps based upon naturalistic phenomenon, how can we not use the same sort of approach when it comes down to churches and clergymen? Largely, because if you actually speak in a certain tone, you get a rise out of people. If you play a certain music note, again, you get a rise of certain people. And so I think the main reason why so many people claim that they feel like the Holy Spirit at a particular church is largely based upon professionals that are trained to play certain music notes or hidden, like, you know, voice volumes that actually make them feel a certain way during the whole entire church service. Now, another claim that Christians make is the power of prayer, largely because they say that prayer has the power to heal. There's actually a study that's been done by the LA Times that talks about the, le the largest study of prayer today finds that it has no power to heal. The largest study yet on the therapeutic power of prayer by a stranger has found that it provided no benefit to the recovery of patients who have undergone cardiac pycrest surgery. An unexpected twist, patients who knew prayers were coming for them had more complications after surgeries than those who did not know. The complications were minor and the doctors assumed that they could have been caused by increased stress on patients worried that their conditions were so bad that they needed prayer. If you go into more details underneath the survey, it says right here, that more than 1,800 patients were divided into three groups. Those that were told that somebody was praying for them, those that were told that only someone might be praying for them and got prayers, and those that were told that someone might pray for them but received no prayers. About 65% of the patients said that they strongly believe in the power of prayers, that two Catholic monasteries and one Protestant groups offer the prayers, they were given patients' first names and the first initial of their last names that the group started praying the night before the surgeries and continued for two weeks. All members of the prayer group recited the same inclination, asking for successful surgery and quick, healthy recovery and no complications. The research said that they did not ask family members of the sick to stop praying because it would have been unethical to do so, meaning some people received more prayers than others. The results show that prayers had no beneficial effect on patients recovery 30 days after surgeries. In conclusion, I think it's pretty much unknowable if there's actually a creator or not. When it comes down to the atheist spectrum, I'm a weak atheist and not a strong atheist. A weak atheist is a person who is not necessarily convinced of the God claims, while a strong atheist will say that there is no God. I think it's pretty much unknowable if there's actually a creator that basically just created everything or not. But based upon these studies that I just cited, it seems as though that the gods, the ones that manifest themselves in the religions and mythology, appear to be based upon the ideas of men. They tend to be man-made. A lot of the stuff that's attributed as supernatural is actually naturalistic in nature. And so it seems as though that the gods as described in religion or mythology just seem as though that they're the man's earliest attempts to explain the unexplainable, but I consider such ideas to be very much outdated. Again, I want to further emphasize, I don't necessarily know is actually a creator or not, but the ones that we see seem to be a placebo effect to me based upon these sort of studies that I just cited in this whole entire video. But uh, what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below. I want to further emphasize that I'm not trying to say that my own point of view is better than everybody else. I'm not claiming to have absolute knowledge. If there's actually data that contradicts what I'm saying this whole entire video, I'm, I'm almost always open to change, you know? 
and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't <laughs> him for Because black friends are rare as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.